Um, I'm going to be talking about how ADHD impacts your child's learning above and beyond uh, what most people um, recognize and, and think of with the term. Uh, so it's more and above and beyond inattention. What I also want you to realize before I do this, because a lot of this is statistics and numbers, um, which can be a little devastating to listen to. What you have to realize is a lot of this comes from research and studies. Uh, these kids do not come out of cookie cutters. They're all different. They all have different needs and strengths, which Georgina will be talking to you about later uh, as well. And a lot of these kids have phenomenal uh, strengths and gifts. Some are very athletic, some are very social, some are very artistic. Some do well in reading, although numbers show us that there is a difficulty in that. So just remember when you're listening to this stuff, these are numbers, they come from studies. Um, please don't be disheartened. Um, what's important to realize when you're listening to this is think about how some of these things are impacting your child and it helps to explain why your kids are doing what they're doing and why they're having difficulty in school with particular things. Okay, so we'll start with the DSM-4 criteria. Most of you have seen this. If you've done the rating scales, you know most of the questions on those rating scales come from these. Basically, it's if the child has six out of nine of these symptoms, then they're considered they meet threshold for the inattentive symptoms. So let's look at some of these quickly. Um, fails to sustaining attention, um, doesn't uh, seem to listen, doesn't follow through on instructions, avoids tasks, loses things, easily distracted. You know all these things. You live with these kids or you teach these kids. What I want you to think about is how, what these symptoms result in. So what does this make the child appear like? What are these symptoms misinterpreted as? And this is generally some of the terms that these kids get labeled as. Uninterested, unmotivated, uncaring, undisciplined, sloppy, stupid, lazy, and defiant. So here, these, these are the impact of inattention and learning, uh, the impact of inattention on learning and output. So this is what we know happens to these kids who have inattention. And by the way, ADHD is not just inattention. What you, we actually should be describing it as is they have problems with the regulation of their attention. So a lot of these children can have problems with over-focusing as much as they can have difficulty with under-focusing. And you know, um, if something grabs your child's attention, usually it's something that's highly stimulating. Uh, things like TV, Nintendo, computer games. Um, sometimes it's a, a subject that they become very engrossed in dinosaurs or, or whatever, and you can't get their attention away from that. And we'll talk about why some of, some of that happens as well. Uh, as they go up in the grades, we know they have more and more gaps in their learning. There's an 8 to 10% decrease in literacy and numeracy scores. Uh, we know this impacts these kids a lot, and it's one of the reasons um, that we, the, the new research is now showing that um, inattention systemically um, affects their learning. So it's not just in certain areas. Work is usually of poor quality because they misunderstand the instructions, their lack of attention to detail, and they usually rush the work. Uh, graphomotor disorder uh, also can be an issue. A lot of these kids have problems with handwriting, so their work tends to look very messy. Uh, productivity is low. This is usually a real problem for these kids. They don't get a lot of work done, especially in class, classroom work, because they're easily uh, distracted. They tire very easily, so it takes a lot of effort for them to pay attention. So these kids will come home and they'll complain of feeling exhausted. And what it is is mental fatigue because they've been trying so hard to pay attention all day and it is very tiring for them. Uh, a lot of problems with organization. We'll talk about that later. And uh, forgetfulness. 
is an issue with these kids as well. They can tend to be disruptive because they're forgetful of routine. So think about what this, uh, how this impacts in a classroom. They will always be leaning over to the kid beside them and say, what are we supposed to be doing? What are we doing next? And they're blamed for uh, causing problems and talking. Uh, they're unsure of instructions. Uh, and because, of course, they're distracted, they will chat to their uh, neighbor and fling pencils off the desk and all this wonderfulness. So these are the DSM-4 um, symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity. And again, uh, there's nine, and six out of nine means you meet threshold. So uh, look at some of these quickly. They, they fidget, they move around too much, they talk excessively, excessively, they blurt out answers before the question is even completed. They have difficulty waiting in line. They interrupt people. So what happens? How do people interpret this behavior? Well, they see it as being very annoying. The kids are usually labeled undisciplined. And people who don't understand ADHD are the people who label the children with, with these terms. Um, destructive behavior. Um, it's very often due th to their impulsivity, but people blame them for being aggressive and, de and destructive. Um, and they can be easily frustrated. Uh, a lot of this results in, as we know, frequent trips to the principal's office. We've got many, many students who are being expelled and uh, some who are actually even looking at permanent expulsion, and I'm talking at, uh, about very young kids. Uh, this is the way we're going, but Georgina's going to talk to you a little bit more about that. The primarily inattentive subtype, uh, you probably all know there's three subtypes of ADHD. Primarily inattentive subtype is what we used to call ADD. Okay, it is, uh, that term actually is not a proper term anymore, although everybody still uses it. Well, these are the symptoms that these kids uh, show up, like in a classroom. Day, very daydreamy. Uh, the term spaced out is often used. Uh, we know they're slower in processing information. They can present as being underactive, lethargic, um, easily confused, slower to comprehend. They have more difficulty uh, focusing um, on work, and very often their retrieval memory is an issue. But this, this is how these kids profile, though. They're not the hyperactive little boys who are up one side of the wall and down the other. But because they're not, and they're not the annoying kids, they're very often the quiet little girl in the back of the class who's not being disruptive, you know, staring out the window, daydreaming, um, they very often don't get diagnosed, and we know these are the kids that we're missing. They're, they're very rarely the disruptive, aggressive ones, and they frequently don't have the oppositional defiant disorder. Russell Barkley is actually um, doing research now because his thought is that this type of ADHD may actually not be ADHD. It may, may be a different disorder altogether. So that's sort of the, the newest research, and he's working on that. So these, these um, symptoms usually uh, can get mis misinterpreted as the child being not too bright, overly shy, unmotivated, uninterested. And as I said, we miss, these are the kids we miss diagnosing. And I'll always remember something Dr. Attila Turgai said in a presentation he did for us many years ago. Frequently, this is the way that girls present with ADHD. Not always, but more often than boys. And very often, we don't diagnose these girls till later teens or their 20s at their first suicide attempt. Because we know that primarily inattentive ADHD frequently comes with depression and anxiety. 
And um, I've been talking to a lot of women who call who are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s who are now being diagnosed with adult ADD who have been treated with depression and anxiety for many, many years unsuccessfully because the underlying ADHD was never diagnosed. So now we're on to new research. So what is this new research telling us? Well, we know that ADHD is much more than just problems with regulating attention. Executive functioning impairment has become very, very evident that, that this is a major issue uh, with people with ADHD, not just children. It becomes even more evident when they become adults. So what is executive functioning impairment? Well, executive functioning is a pro the, are the processes that we use to control and integrate self-management. Now, that's a nice term, but what does it mean? A good way to think of it, and, and Dr. Thomas Brown came up with this uh, analogy, and you can go to the, his website and look at some of his research. He calls um, executive functioning the conductor of the orchestra. So think of your brain as, as an orchestra. Well, let's think of an orchestra first. You may have a lot of gifted musicians in this orchestra. They may all have practiced very hard. They may be excellent musicians. Uh, if you do not have a conductor in front of them, what comes out? Obviously, the sound is not very good. Everybody's doing their, their own thing, uh, different volumes, different tempo, uh, everybody's timing is off, and, and it sounds like chaos. Well, this is what happens when your brain does not have executive functioning skills. So it's not that the child is not putting a lot of effort into it. It is that the, our frontal lobe, which we're... Um, we have our executive functioning proceeds, um, it's not working properly. So uh, what I like to refer to executive functioning disorder as is a hidden learning disability. Because if we think about other learning disabilities, like say dyscalculia, which is a, a math learning disability, the other parts of the child's schoolwork and learning will be all right. There won't be an issue but they will show as having a deficit in math. What happens is that that becomes very evident to teachers and parents. Okay, the child's okay in everything else. Why is there a significant problem in math? Well, then that learning disability has a greater chance of being diagnosed. If you have problems with executive functioning process, it hits you across all your subject in your entire school day. And this is why. We're going to go through the different parts of executive functioning. So one of the most important one is active working memory impairment. And this is something actually that Rosemary Tannock has been researching for many years. So what is active working um, memory? The easiest way to think about it is uh, similarly to a computer and computer files. You know when you're working on your computer and you have a lot of files open at the same time and you're flipping back and forth one, from one file to the other, our brain also has these files. And active working memory is when we have a lot of files open at the same time and we're flipping back and forth. So when, when do we use these? Well, we actually use working memory all day long, but a good example is um, for writing. So say a child gets an assignment to write a couple of paragraphs on what they did in, during summer vacation. Let's think of all the files that child has to have open. So obviously they have to think about what they want to write about, but beyond that, they have to think of words, so vocabulary. They have to open the file of how to put those words into a sentence then that sentence into a paragraph. But then it's more, even more basic than that. They have to think about letter formation. If they're cursive writing, they have to open the file about where that letter starts and where it ends so they can join those letters. Um, a lot of kids with ADHD have significant problems with cursive writing, kids with LD in general. That is why they, when they get older, they very often revert to printing. Uh, what else do they have to think about? They have to think about leaving that finger space between words. I know my kids would jam all the words together. 
They have to think about punctuation, okay? That's an awful lot of files to have open in your brain at the same time, flipping back and forth. We do it all day long. We don't think about this. But if you have a deficit in working memory, it impairs you right across the board. The other thing to think about is how many files does a child have to have open to weigh the pros and cons of their behavior? Think about that for a minute. How many different files? So we'll, we'll talk about uh, that right now, actually. Um, these kids have real problems with hindsight and foresight. Now, to regulate behavior, what a child usually has to do is use their hindsight. So they have to remember a situation that was similar to the situation they're in. They have to evaluate it and say, okay, is this the same situation? Is it different? How is it different? They then have to use their foresight and say, okay, if I do the same thing, what is going to happen? So they flip back and forth and back and forth between hindsight and foresight, evaluating what they're going to do. And this has to happen very, very quickly. In, you, um, couple that with an impairment with memory, and you can see why these kids don't often learn from past behavior, and these kids are constantly blamed for this. How many times have I told you not to do that? Well, if you have poor hindsight and foresight, you're not going to be very good at evaluating evaluating that or remembering that. It always, I always chuckle, well, half laugh, half cry, when, when uh, I talk to teachers and they complain about kids with ADHD being manipulative. And I say to them, okay, let's think about this for a minute. Here are kids with difficulty with problem solving, with hindsight, with foresight. Their organizational skills are terrible. What do you need to be manipulative and be successful at it, right? You need a lot of problem solving. You, you, know, you need hindsight, foresight. If you're going to come out you know, ahead in all this manipulation, these kids constantly shoot themselves in the foot. And I said, you know what? If they were truly manipulative, they would learn very darn quick to stop it because they are so poor at it. But anyway, I'm still fighting that battle. Um, so some of the, the other problems kids have with problem solving, um, they have difficulty with being flexible. Um, they have difficulty with what we call concrete thinking as well. They, they have a certain way to think about something, and they, they don't look at other options. My youngest uh, went through the gifted program, and in the gifted program, they have a lot of in-class time where they work on projects. So he would frequently come home, and he'd have an, an hour and a half in the day to work on this project, and nothing would be done. And I, I could I'd never believe it. And I said, why do we have to do hours of this at home? Nothing was done. You had all this time in class. Well, so-and-so was using my book. And I said, there wasn't another book? No, that was the book I needed. That was it. I said, you couldn't ask the teacher to go to the library to get another book? You couldn't ask the child to share the book? You couldn't ask to reserve it for the next day? Maybe you could uh, do something else and, and draw the pictures rather than do the research? Nope. He needed that book, and, and that is a great example of concrete thinking and why these kids have problems with problem solving and being flexible. They see one solution to the problem, and that's it. They have difficulty following rules and instructions, not only comprehending them, but also remembering them. So a lot of the defiance that they are accused of is just because they have difficulty keeping it all straight. Something else that is a significant impairment for them is the sense of time and time management. They are very often horrendous at trying to estimate how long it will take to do something. They overestimate or they underestimate, so they're always late uh, in, in doing everything. You'll also notice that they have a very poor sense of time. So when they're on the computer, six hours can go by, and they think it was 15 minutes. 
or you're going from point A to point B, they're bored, how many times in the car you ask, are we there yet, are we there yet, are they there yet? Because when they're bored, it seems like time is standing still. Uh, they're overwhelmed with large assignments and they are unable to break down anything that is large and overwhelming. They just totally blank out uh, and, and freeze um, on it and that's something they need a lot of help with. They have great difficulty uh, in beginning tasks. Again, part of it is because they're overwhelmed, but a lot of times they just don't know how to start the work in class. Um, these kids have uh, problems with cognitive shifting as well. And what do we ask these kids to do all day long? So if you take a child who's been told to do 10 math questions. He has problems beginning the work, so he's late in starting as it is. He finally gets his attention on, he gets into it, he does a few questions because he's been distracted, so he doesn't get much done. And then what does the teacher say? Okay, put your math books away, we're now doing spelling. His mind is going, oh my gosh, I've got to switch what I'm thinking about. And for some of these kids, cognitive shifting is almost painful and they, they will uh, react to it when we ask them to cognitively shift. They, again, they don't remember routines. They need frequent um, instructions, continuous instructions. We tell teachers one of the, uh, the best ways to get around this is to post the routine schedules clearly. When other kids have already got it clear by October, they know how the week goes, they know when they have gym, when they have music these kids are still struggling with it in March and April. So having them clearly posted is great. What we do know is if we don't help these kids with their organizational supports, they um, very often will fail. We know they miss signals. Um, a lot of the signals they miss are social signals. If teachers um, give an instruction sort of in, in the middle uh, while they're talking about something else and they say, by, by the way, we're having a test Friday, go right over the child's head. Um, they miss a lot of these su subtle signals. They have a reduced sensitivity to errors so they don't pick up their own errors in their work. And again, they, they uh, have difficulty sustaining motivation, um, and that is inherent in, in ADHD. These ten, kids tend to give up um, more easily, more so when they're asked to cognitively um, complete a task, but also in other, other physical tasks, cleaning the room or anything. They will tend to give up very easily if they can't uh, organize it or think of how to do it quickly. These kids live in the now. They have a very difficult time thinking about long-term goals. And when they're young, not a huge issue. The older they get, it becomes more significant issue. Uh, we know these kids are impaired in uh, listening and reading comprehension. Um, they very often have difficulty with uh, sequences, verbal um, instructions. How many times have you told your son or daughter to go upstairs, brush their teeth, make their bed, get their books in their backpack and bring it down to the door and 15 minutes later you go upstairs and they're standing in the bathroom staring at themselves in the mirror and cannot remember what they're supposed to do. Anyway, what we have to learn is not to give them sequences of instructions and and really that is um, what parents and educators have to do with a lot of these deficits is we have to change the way we're doing things. We have to understand where the defi deficit comes in, we have to teach them strategies mm -hmm. and we also have to change the way we're doing things. Um, reading, one of the difficulties these kids frequently have is um, reading um, large pages of material. So the higher they go up in school, um, some of these kids will complain that they've read the page, they get down to the bottom of the page and they go, huh? 
they honestly don't remember what they've read. They go back to the top of the page again, read the page again, get to the bottom. And this time they may have gotten quarter, half of it, but they know they've got gaps, read it again. So this is really time consuming and frustrating to kids by the time they get to higher elementary and high school when they're required to read a lot of material. It's um, a way to think about it is, if, have you ever tried to read when you're very, very tired? Same type of thing. You'll have read the page and, and nothing will have gotten in. Um, it, it, it is hugely um, frustrating, and this is why a lot of these kids don't like um, to read. Uh, I talked about cognitive shifting before. Um, these kids become quite frustrated and reactionary is a nice term for it. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a synopsis. Um, your son or daughter had just complained 20 minutes ago. They're absolutely starving. You said they can't have anything to eat. You're making their most favorite dinner. It will be ready in 20 minutes. Meanwhile, they've plopped themselves in front of the TV and they're watching a TV show. 20 minutes later, you say, oh, great, dinner's ready, come for dinner, and they turn around and they say, I won't say it, but... <laughs> and and you're, you're floored because you're like, what is going on? You said you're starving. This is your favorite dinner. You have just asked them to cognitively shift. And remember I said these kids can become over-focused in something that's highly stimulating. It's very difficult for them to change their focus. So um, little reminders, you know, in 10 minutes... We're going to have dinner. In five minutes, we're going to have dinner. Also, sometimes it's just being patient and ignoring some of that type of stuff. Um, our, um, our youngest who, by the way, I have three sons with, with ADHD who are, so I know of what I speak. <laughs> they're all grown. They're out of the house. They've graduated from school. They're all working. I have two weddings. Two of them are getting married this year. So you see, it can be done. It's. I'm not going to say. No, no. I'm. I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just. What I'm saying, and 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 a lot of parents will get very disheartened by a lot of this information. What I'm saying is, half heart. They do eventually learn a lot of this stuff. Um, it does take longer. Mind you, remember remember my youngest I was telling you had problems with problem solving and thinking of alternatives, the one who's, who said his the other kid had the book. He phoned last week. His fiance uh, went back. She's from Omaha. She went back for wedding plans and my husband got a phone call and he said, Dad, my uh, debit card doesn't work so I can't get the money on my wash card to do my wash. And my husband, who also has ADHD, said, and what do you want me to do about it? <laughs> perfect example of, yeah, perfect example of, he couldn't think of another way to do it. And I was then on the phone with his fiance a few days later, and she said, yeah, John phoned me and said his debit card couldn't work, and he couldn't get the laundry done. And my comment was, what do you want me to do from Omaha? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? They, they do eventually learn it. It does not all go away. Um, some of it is just a deficit for life. Um, they learn strategies um, around it. So, you know, they get through it. We get through it. Um, and you know what? Having a, a sense of humor is sometimes the best way to, to handle it. Um, about this, this cognitive shifting, um, my youngest when he was at home, I uh, used to have to cut the grass, and my husband would go up and say, okay, John, you got to cut the grass. Well, he was usually on his computer game or on the computer doing homework or something, and immediately you could count on it. The re reaction would be, why do I always have to cut the grass, and don't you know I have allergies, and I've got work to do, and I can't do this? And my husband's response would be, you know what? And the two of them would, would get into it. And I said, haven't you learned yet? After like about 10 years of doing this, you walk in, you say, John, the grass needs to be cut. When you get everything else, you turn around and you say, I want it cut by the end of the day. And you leave. And usually 20 minutes later, the lawnmower was, was started. Some of this type of reactionary behavior, you just have to ignore 
unless it gets totally abusive, and just realize where it's coming from. You can teach them ways to um, express it in a little more friendly way. Um, sometimes it, it takes a lot of lessons, um, but we have to give these kids some leeway. Internalized speech. Um, internalized speech is something that we all learn to do very young. If you've, if you've ever watched two- and three-year-olds playing, they talk to themselves, and they instruct themselves, and they will talk to their dolls and everything else. That is speech before it is internalized, and a lot of that speech is they're directing themselves. By the time they get to school, a lot of that speech becomes internalized, and we do it all day long. In your head, you are giving your ins yourself instructions all day long. And if you think about it for a minute, it you do. You know, you're like, okay, where am I driving? Where I'm going? Okay, I've got to turn left there. It's just in your head. These kids have delayed internalized speech to 30 to 40 per, they're 30 to 40 percent behind usually so what is this result in well something uh, self-talk or internalized speech is used for is to direct our own behavior so when they don't have that developed internalized speech it will also impact their behavior so here's some stats uh, that can be a little depressing, but they're interesting uh, for you to know anyway. 90% of these kids have poor school performance than we would expect for their IQ levels. The comorbid learning dis disabilities are 24 to 70%, and the reason there's such a wide span there is because it depends on how you define a learning disability. There's all kinds of different ways. and. Um, different researchers define it differently, so that's why the studies have come out with different numbers. Uh, those are the span uh, of, of um, problems the kids have in reading, spelling, math, and handwriting. You'll notice handwriting is 60 plus percent, something that's pretty pervasive. Um, decreased productivity, we talked about that. Difficulty adapting and self-sufficiency. So a lot of these kids, again, will just throw their hands up and say, I don't know what to do. Unfortunately, they usually don't ask for help in a nice way, but again, frustration coming in. Uh, delayed motor coordination, and this is something I wish gym teachers would realize. The, a lot of these kids have delayed motor coordination, both fine motor co coordination and gross motor coordination. Um, and they, re they have reduced physical fitness, strength, and stamina. Now, again, remember, not all kids with ADHD. You can have kids with ADHD who are very, very athletic and coordinated. We're just saying, generally, this is something you uh, need to look out for. What are the long-term academic risks? Uh, re grade retention. 25 to 50 percent. Now, I need to let you know these stats are from the U.S. Uh, the Canadian government does not put any money into researching ADHD, so we actually don't even know the true incidence of ADHD in Canada. Uh, so all these numbers come from the U.S., but we knew, do know from worldwide studies the incident of ADHD is pretty standard worldwide, anywhere between 5 to 12 percent, again, depending on the diagnosis and the, and, and the parameters, um, but it is not a North American phenomenon of kids who watch too much TV and don't exercise and eat too much sweets and all that poor parenting and all that, those myths you always hear. It is everywhere in the world. Um, more suspensions and expulsions, and um, this is what's heartbreaking, a 30 to 40 percent dropout rate. Um, really wish uh, people in the school boards and ministry would get this with these kids, that if they receive more help, maybe they wouldn't drop out. Uh, fewer enter post-secondary, um, 20%. Mind you, when you get to post-secondary, the accommodations you can get around ADHD are far easier to get and far better. Um, so do not talk your kids 
out of going into higher education if that is what they want um, because they're, they do receive accommodations there. And the kids that do make it to graduate or uh, post-secondary, uh, far fewer actually graduate. Kathleen Nadeau, who presented for us a few years ago, and she specializes in girls and in women, but I was talking to her about uh, gifted kids with ADHD, and um, we had Thomas Brown presenting on giftedness and ADHD, and she said in the U.S. they are not allowed to breathe those two words together in the same sentence. ADHD is um, recognized as a disability in, in uh, the U.S. formally under federal law. Uh, it's recognized here too, but not formally. We'll, we'll get into that later. But um, she was saying that she strongly believed that all the unfinished um, theses, or theses, or what's the correct term, were uh, people with brilliant people with ADHD who just couldn't get it together and organize it enough to get their thesis done. So, uh, what are we looking at time? Okay, social and emotional impairments. We all know these kids are more easily frustrated, but here's the kicker. Not only are they more easily frustrated, when they are frustrated, they have a much harder time dealing with their frustration. Uh, emotional control is a problem for these kids. But here's, here's an interesting way of looking at it. We very often accuse these kids of reacting out of proportion. What we know with these kids is they actually feel more. So they're more sensitive, um, more things um, bother them, annoy them. Um, so they're actually reacting in proportion to how they're feeling. They just feel more than other people. More irritable and moody. Um, there's, as I said before, much greater likelihood uh, for a comorbidity. That's a big, real big, scary word. All it means is coexisting disorder. In medical terms, we, we call them comorbid disorders. So it's just a, a disorder that exists along with another disorder. Now, the interesting thing about um, anxiety in particular uh, kids and adults can have anxiety because of the ADHD. So because they're trying to constantly deal with the ADHD symptoms, and if you've ever realized uh, sometimes when you can't concentrate, you increase your anxiety, and it helps you to concentrate because your adrenaline is up. Some of these kids do this all day long to try and keep their attention up. What happens is they end up with an anxiety disorder, but it's a different type of anxiety disorder. It is due to them trying to cope with the ADHD. They can also have a true coexisting anxiety disorder, so you have two separate disorders that coexist, and this is why these kids need to be seen by specialists for them to be able to decipher uh, which is which and which treatment to start first. Because if they think the anxiety is caused by the ADHD, you treat the ADHD first and wait for the anxiety to come down. If it is a true full-blown anxiety disorder, you want to be treating that as well. Again, um, more likelihood of suicide ideation and attempts, and it, it's not nice to hear, but it's something that we have to be aware of as parents, especially for adolescents. Um, again, they miss those social cues. You know what? We don't teach social skills. Most societies don't teach social skills. We just expect kids to absorb that you don't stand closer than, you know, about two feet from somebody. These kids get right up in your face sometimes. Uh, they don't read social expressions very well, and the teacher is frowning at them. They don't get it. They don't, you know, they're not picking up. They're doing something that's annoying the teacher, and they just go right on, and the teacher can't figure out why this kid is not getting her her frowning and her looking mad and all this stuff. What, as parents, you may have to realize is that you actually have to teach these kids some of these skills. And some kids um, are poor enough at this that you actually have to stand them in front of the mirror and say, this is a smile. What does this mean? If somebody has this expression, what do you think they're thinking? Even to go that, you know, basic. But sometimes watch, watch your kids who are having problems with other kids 
and and try and pick up some of the things they're doing um, that are annoying other kids that they are totally unaware of. Uh, again, this is why they have problems making and sustaining friends, and unfortunately what this sometimes results in is they end up in the less desirable peer groups, not that they're bad kids and not that they want to do a lot of these things that the other kids are doing who get into trouble, but these are the only kids who accept them. And their impulsivity frequently gets them... Um, into trouble because it, these kids are what we call ready, fire, aim. So they get the thought, they do the deed, and if you watch a child who's young, young enough who has not learned to put that mask on, you'll see it actually dawn on them. So they'll do something and they'll go, oh, I don't believe I did that again. When they get older, they learn to mask that. And by the way, we actually teach kids with ADHD to lie. How do we do that? What do we say to them when they've done one of these things? We say, why did you do that? What do they know? They don't understand they have problems with organizational skills or, problem, or cognitive shifting or, or impulsivity. I mean, wouldn't it be great if the principal said, why did you do that? They would say, well, you know, it's due to my impulsivity and my low frustration control and the teacher asked me to cognitive shift. That's not going to happen. What happens is these kids blow up. And again, because they're so impulsive, they don't take the time to consider the consequences. They get the thought, they do the deed, and remember that problems, the problems with the hindsight and foresight? If that's really poor, how are they going to evaluate what they're doing? So they constantly get themselves in the problem. But we nail them on this, and we say, why did you do this? They don't know. They have to come up with something. Generally, it's, I didn't do it. Right? And then we say, what do you mean you didn't do it? I saw you. I was standing right here in front of you. And they go, oh. they come up with something else. We force them to lie because they don't know why they're doing what they're doing. So we, we need to stop that um, because that, that is actually something that can be very detrimental for these kids. And actually teaching them the, the words to explain what they're feeling you know, explain to them what frustration is. You might use some other terms for it, but, uh, and explain, explain the feeling. You know, when your chest feels really tight, when your face gets hot, you know, when you're clenching your fists, what are you feeling? Well, when you're feeling that, it's because you're frustrated. What can we do to help you with that? Uh, what are ways that you can lower your frustration? There are lots and lots and lots of strategies to do this. Uh, safe places in, in the, school, room, or in the uh, um, school, places for them to go, to calm down, a mentor to talk to, lots and lots of strategies. But they have to be able to recognize what they're feeling. So what is the impact of the student on, on all this? We know these kids have a huge problem with their self-esteem. And that's due to, one, their lack of ex, uh, success, and also because they're being stigmatized and unfairly labeled. If you were told for the last umpteen years of your life that you're lazy, you're stupid, you're not trying um, hard enough, um, you're not working hard enough, why didn't you know not to do that, why didn't you know to do that, to do that it, it eats away at your self-esteem. Again, isolated, no friends. They end up frustrated uh, a lot of times with depression and anxiety. What we know with adults who have gone uh, a long time with not being recognized with ADHD or receive the treatment, they self-medicate. And we, knew, we know um, drug abuse, alcohol abuse um, is very, very common in adults who have not been treated. Now, a lot of the stats on this, uh, there's the uh, MTA long-term study um, was done on uh, kids who are now in their 20s who were studied when, when they were children. Um, a lot of the stats, and, and Rus this is Russell Barkley's research, a lot of the stats say, um, you know, uh, Poor levels of education, lower income, 
a lot of problems with substance abuse, uh, jail time, a lot of this stuff. But what we also have to realize is back then, we thought these kids outgrew ADHD in their adolescence, and a lot of them went off their treatment in, in adolescence and were not on treatment in, the, in their 20s, and they didn't get a lot of follow-up care um, at that time. So we have to take that into consideration as well. Okay, now I'm going to stop there. The original MTA study is a study that was done with um, a large group of kids and they were put in uh, three different groups. One group received just medication, one group received um, just um, behavioral strategies, but excellent behavioral strategies. Um, the parents did, the, the children did, any type of social uh, strategy, learning, behavioral strategy, they got that. Then there was another group that got everything. So the gold standard of everything, and this we're not talking about what was just in the community. These kids got intensive whatever. Uh, they were followed for a number of years, and basically what this study said was the kids who just received medication did just about, just a tiny bit less on the scale well than the kids who got everything. So we knew that more than anything else, it was the medication that had an impact on these kids. Since then, you know, We've gotten better at some of these strategies and, and this type of stuff, but we still know that medication has a, a huge impact, especially children whose primary symptom is problems with regulating attention. Because you can do all the strategies you want. If you don't have that window of attention to even teach the child strategies, you're, you're lost. Um, but now they've done a follow-up. So this is a follow-up study on all these kids who were in that original MTA study. And these kids are mostly in their 20s now. So they're looking at them long-term and saying, okay, what has happened to these kids now years later? And a lot of those stats I was reading you, like 90% um, poor in, in, in school functioning, 30 to 40 percent drop rate, that all comes from that long-term MTA study, and that's Russell Barkley's data um, in there. So, But again, remember, these are kids who were not treated and followed up for sometimes many, many, many years. It, it depends on the child. It depends on the severity. ADHD is an, on a continuum. It, you, the child can have it very mild or very severe or anywhere in between. The child can have it with uh, a lot of different coexisting disorders. If they have it with learning disabilities as well, it can be more of an issue. If the child has ADHD and Tourette's, it can be more of an issue. Uh, generally, ADHD is not diagnosed before the age of six, and I say that generally. There are three-year-olds have been, who have been diagnosed with ADHD and put on medication because um, they just never sit still, they don't sleep, they don't, basically the family cannot function, the child can't function. Uh, so there's no rule of thumb as to when ADHD um, should or should not be diagnosed. Basically, it's uh, when your child is showing signs of, of impairment, and that is the rule of thumb for diagnosing ADHD. 
everybody is inattentive sometimes, everybody's distractive sometimes, everybody's hyperactive sometimes. The, what the rule of thumb is, is if those symptoms are impairing that child or adult in, in their life, and that is when we say, okay, go for an assessment, um, have it assessed now. Okay. At a certain point, uh, yeah, we, we know with certain behaviors, routines, um, ha being consistent and making those repetitive, like having a bedtime routine and a schedule and you always go through the same, those things are good because it becomes a habit. If a child has a, a real uh, deficit, graphomotor, graphomotor disorder, whatever, you know, you can't kind of flog a dead horse. Best thing to do with these kids is get them keyboarding as soon as possible. That is the best thing for these kids. My first response would be some one-to-one -one time. Uh, generally, you know, the kids who aren't ADHD are the ones who get ignored. You know, it, we, we make a huge mistake as, as parents, and Dr. Jan talks about this a lot. We give attention to bad behavior as, as teachers and, and parents. You know, we do that. How many times do you go up to your child and say, you know what, you are sitting there so nice and quietly eating your dinner, good job. We don't do that. We're busy doing other things. Mind you, as they're flinging their food off the plate, you know, giving it to the dog, we're right on them right, right away, right? So the child, we're so busy with the kids with, with ADHD um, and giving them attention. You know what? Sometimes just taking the non-ADHD child for a day on their own and, you know, finding... A grandparent or your spouse or whatever to spend time. You want to make the other child feel that they're not being ignored. The other thing is educate the other child. Ex teach them about what ADHD is, why their sibling is having these problems, so they can put it in context and not view their brother or sister as just a nasty child. And there's fabulous books on out right now. A great book by Dr. Nick Vincent called My Brain Needs Glasses. Explains ADHD wonderfully. Oh, and before I forget, Dr. Much, uh, Dr. Martin Kutcher, who wrote a book called ADHD Living Right Now, and also a book called The Kids in the Syndrome Mix, which is a great book on all kinds of different disorders and trying to figure out what your child has. He just sent me his new book to review um, for him. It's not out in print yet, but it's called this, uh, Organizing the Disorganized Child. Great book. Um, actually, I gave it to uh, Denise, uh, my secretary, who has three kids with ADD, um, and she said she wore out a highlighter, just highlighting really con <laughs> concrete strategies on, on how to organize things. I, I wish I had the book for my kids when, when they were in school. It should be out late summer. Who's the Dr. Martin Kutcher, uh, K U T. Uh, S C H E R. You can Google him. His 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 other two books will come up. But uh, look for it late summer. Hopefully, we can have him here in 2010 to speak again. Yep. What it does is it turns his attention on so he can pay more attention to what he should be doing. Medication does not teach or help organizational skills. Medication primarily works on the attention 
can sometimes decrease hyperactivity and impulsivity, but we generally give it for attention. And by the way, I have not met very many parents who make the decision to put their child on medication purely for behavior. It is generally because they're having problems in school, they're academically becoming behind, they're having gaps in their learning. So everything you hear out in the media about parents drugging their kids because they're too lazy to discipline them and, and teachers are all begging for these kids to be on medication because it, is, it doesn't happen now. Some of the school stuff does, but <laughs> that's another issue. But it, it's the inattention that we're trying to deal with. And by the way, is there a reason he's on, on the old twice a day, Ritalin? We're having big reactions from the meds. Oh, okay. And so right now it's just... It, it works hard, better. Hard, so we're just Ah. Uh, right. Okay. Ah. Uh, okay. Okay. I'll take one more question, and then, and you know what? We'll be around in the breaks if we've got other questions. Yep.